How's it going, everyone? This is Russell Clay. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Russell J. Clay. We have Eric with us again, who did our slate breakdown for the week. How's it going, Eric? I'm doing good. I'm not quite doing as well as the New England Patriots after last night uh, and LeGarrette Blunt, but I'm doing pretty well, and I'm excited for week three, which uh, has some dud football games in there, but there are some ones I'm really excited about. There certainly are, um, and there's quite a few players I'm really excited about. But, yeah, as you mentioned, I can't imagine many many people are doing better than, uh, you know, LeGarrette Blount and uh, Bill Belichick today. Yeah. <laughs> Last week I am still seething uh, with that Giants-Saints game, you know, not paying off for us in Daily Fantasy. I put so much exposure on those two teams and got no reward. In fact, I finished up with a big negative after a pretty decent week one. So week three is the turnaround week. So I had a few good lineups and tournaments, um, but it was just so hard to fade. Like, even if you're being contrarian, you still wanted to get a piece of that giant Saints game. And you know what? If you faded that game, sure, that's great, but it probably wasn't good process. Eli still threw for like 360 yards or yeah, something. Yeah, the, so. the receivers didn't help them with uh, some drops. Odell Beckham dropped one in the end zone and uh, some fumbles, and Victor Cruz had a fumble after a long catch. Yeah, so that was rough. But uh, anyway, we're moving forward. We got a whole week here to uh you know plug away um first first matchup on the on the docket cardinals bills now the bills are at home uh it should be a, a sort of different vibe from the first few weeks but then they uh face the cardinals who should you know their defense should roll through that offense you know yeah, I, I call this a potential trap game for DFS players because after that second week, the Bills at home, uh, which they should have a pretty good secondary, they had an awful week against uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick and the Jets. Uh, you know, I, I know those are pretty good receivers, and you bring Carson Palmer in with his deep set of weapons, and it looks like it could be a thrashing uh, by the Cardinals, but I, I think this is one that's going to surprise some people. I think the Bills are going to play a bit better. It's interesting, I wanted to point this out, that last week the Bills stunk on defense and they fired their offensive coordinator. <laughs> so yeah. it, right. it, creates, it creates a little bit of the difficulty in understanding how the Bills might play. I know they want to pass the ball uh, a bit more and more effectively, um, but I don't like the matchup against the Cardinals uh, in the pass game. Uh, I I don't like LaShawn McCoy up front against them either. Uh, so you got to fade all your bills. And because the bills are going to struggle, yet I don't think they're going to get blown out, I don't love the Cardinals as much as some people might. I, I'm with you on this. And, and we hadn't talked um, matchups, you know, for this week before the show. But, yeah, this is kind of the direction I'm heading. I mean, I don't mind Fitzgerald, but at the same time, it's not like, oh, he's a cash game option, especially at his prices, uh, especially after, you know, the first two weeks of production. And Sammy Watkins didn't practice today. Uh, you had him listed here already as a guy you probably weren't touching. I mean, if he's out, I just can't envision myself touching any Bills. Yeah, it's tough with the new offensive coordinator. You can't quite be sure. And then you add in the fact that the Cardinals' defense is coming off that pounding of Jameis Winston. And Jameis Winston looked outstanding in week one and then worthless in mm. week two. So that Cardinals' defense is very, very capable. Um, I, I think this is a trap game. People are going to jump on the Cardinals and probably not get uh, what they pay for. Certainly agree. Uh, this is definitely – this is the definition of a trap game. Um, I, I could see Carson Palmer ending up with his 250 and two like most weeks, but yeah. it might be a little tougher than people think for sure. Uh, next one here, uh, a much more interesting fantasy relevant game for me, uh, just in terms of some of the value options in that Raiders offense. What are you looking at here? Well, I think the Raiders are one of the more underrated, underappreciated teams in football. They're actually a two point dog at the Titans, which I know the Titans are coming off a victory over the, the awful Lions, but uh, the, Raider, the Raiders have some juice. I, I think uh, Michael Crabtree uh, goes along with the underrated theme. He's, he's underpriced in many leagues. 
Uh, I'm not loving the game for fantasy plays because I think it'll be uh, a, mo a game that's lower on the number. Uh, but if you're going to consider something, consider the Titans backs, uh, DeMarco Murray, and then maybe even uh, Derrick Henry uh, pounding it away up front at home against the Raiders. Fair enough. I'm, I'm kind of looking at Amari Cooper. I don't know how much Derek Carr exposure I'm going to have, but I'm certainly looking at Cooper. I think this is an exploitable matchup. Titans have been bad against uh, number one receivers so far this year. I think that's something to definitely look at. As you mentioned, DeMarco Murray is certainly intriguing, uh, especially at his price. I look at Delaney Walker again as as a cash game guy on, on DraftKings, FanDuel, a little pricey. Mariota, fifty nine hundred on DK. Ha! Ah, <laughs> I'm gonna think about it in some tournaments, but this offense around him just doesn't look all that enticing for fantasy purposes. So the the Raiders have been bad, but I don't think they're quite as bad as they've shown the first two weeks in some tough matchups. Right. So yeah, they've um, played Drew Brees and Matt Ryan, two guys that yeah. can really sling it. Uh, Mariota is not slinging it with that receiving core he's got. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a game that's heavy on the running backs and tight ends. That's why I like yep. Murray. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and I, again, I really like Mariota, so I'm always looking to play him, but this isn't a spot necessarily, especially with some of the other cheap options. Um, speaking of cheap options, Ryan Tannehill and the Dolphins versus the <laughs> just – graveyard of, of a football team, the yeah. Cleveland Browns. What, what are you looking at here? Browns only projected for 17 today, 16 and a half. Yeah, I think the uh, the Browns' uh, luck is there. It's just all bad. When they finally look like they have something in Corey Coleman, he breaks his hand. He's now out four to six. Uh, and then you're going to Miami that's coming off of two losses – at Seattle and at New England, two of the toughest places to win. That's a pretty good defensive front when you're talking about Cameron Wake, Mario Williams, and Donna Kinsu. I think they're going to get after it up front. I think uh, the the run game might be slow for the Dolphins because you're not sure about Arian Foster or Jay Ajayi. Uh, but Tannehill, uh, Landry, maybe even uh, Devontae Parker, Stills. And I also like Jordan Cameron. You know, he's a, a sleeper. Uh, at a home game that I think is heavily in favor of the Dolphins. Uh, he's coming off a TD last week on seven targets. And, uh, you know, week one, the, the Browns gave up uh, six and 58 to Zach Ertz. And then in week two, nine and 102 to Dennis Pitta. Well, that's all over Pitta, by the way. I just want to uh, remind our listeners <laughs> for that one. Uh, I think uh, Jordan Cameron gets in the end zone and has a good day. I think that's, that's probably the best of the plays in a game. Uh, that it's probably going to be heavily in the Dolphins' uh, side. And the uh, Dolphins' defense, of course, when you're facing the third-string quarterback for the Browns. The Browns are now on their third quarterback in three weeks. I, I got my invite to the Dennis Pitta party last week, and it just kind of sat with the rest of the junk mail, and it ended up getting thrown away, and I somehow didn't. You know, I didn't go to the party, but I'm in this week. You know, better late than never, so I'm here. And I do want to say the way you said Jordan Cameron is the same exact way when I talked to Renee Miller. That's the same exact voice. It's the same exact <laughs> tone. Are you trying to and say I, I have a woman's voice? No. <laughs> and no. The way I feel like everyone thinks about Jordan Cameron, it's like, hey, you know what? This is an option. And we're all kind of surprised, but it's like, yeah. Jordan Cameron is definitely an option this week as as a tournament tight end, and uh, I, I think that's certainly a way to go. I mean, I, I like Landry and Parker in this game, uh, and I do like Tannehill, but I think Landry and Parker are good ways to get uh, Tannehill exposure. But again, I'm not counting out Stills or, or Jordan Cameron either as other guys in that offense. Um to get at least some exposure to that team um, in all formats, including cash games, including their defense, who I'm not even a big fan of. But going to be tough for Cody Kessler and the Browns to really move. Like you mentioned, Corey Coleman, that's that's a pretty devastating injury already. Yeah. Um, Ravens and Jaguars. Uh, what are you looking at here, I guess? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking at Bortles and – He's kind of been a sack 
turnover machine, which which might make you consider the Ravens' defense if you're looking for a sleeper. Um, you know, they're on the road, um, and and they're they're able to be exposed by Bortles, who hasn't really come through yet. We we expected you know him to be a 303 monster with the receivers he's got. You know, Allen Robinson hasn't quite been there uh, to his level yet. Uh, Allen Hearns, uh, you know. Julius Thomas, he's going to be banged up just about every week. But those three targets are pretty solid. Um, I just don't love it this way. I think next week is the week for the Jags. Um, so I'm kind of fading this game, uh, you know, even though you, you could see the Jags doing some damage uh, potentially against the Ravens team. that I thought they were going to be better, and, and last week kind of made me realize, man, the Browns really hung it on them early. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not in love with this. Uh, Ravens team. I guess if you're playing someone, Dennis Pitt is still there at value, and uh, you know Justin Forsett. If they score, it's probably going to be him. I, I do like Pitt. I like you mentioned. I think that's a great play on both sides with with price considered. Yeah, I was kind of excited about the Ravens after Week One, and man, they like you said they got it handed to them early on. Isaiah Crowell was running all over them. Corey Coleman was just doing everything. So. That, that was definitely ugly. As far as this Jaguars team, I think this might be a nice week to jump back on the Allen Robinson train, maybe in a contrarian tournament type of way. But overall, uh, this Jaguars offense is a little underwhelming so far. So I agree. This game is probably going to be a little over overexposed in the general general view, you know, with, with Bortles and uh, Allen Robinson and Hearns. Um, the Lions and the Packers, a uh, total of 47. Is this the week Aaron Rodgers sort of gets on track here? Yeah, you assume after two road games, uh, coming home against the Lions team that was absolutely torched by Andrew Luck in uh, week one, and then they lost to Mariota in week two at home. Uh, I think this Lions team is going to struggle against uh, Rodgers. Um, Jordy Nelson's averaged 110 and a touchdown in his past three home games against uh, the Lions. So uh, Nelson Rodgers is a good play. Uh, you know, Cobb's always going to be there for targets. And I think the, the truest sleeper here is Jared Cook, who's still cheap on a uh, quiet start to the season, but that preseason hype will catch up to him here. The Lions tight, uh, have given up an average of eight catches for 90 yards and two touchdowns through two games to tight ends. Uh, so Cook is a nice play at his price. That's that's certainly fair. As you mentioned, Jordy, you know, the touchdown machine with Rodgers. And even though he does look a little limited, uh, I think Jordy uh, will, will certainly be involved in the red zone at the very least. Uh, I'm still a big fan of Rodgers. I know he's been a little skittish, you know, in the pocket the last few weeks, but I think he's going to be fine against this defense. As you mentioned, uh, Jared Cook with the, with a pretty good matchup there for tight ends, so that's intriguing. Are you on Randall Cobb at all, or is that just going? With uh, I think Cobb? in PPR he's going to be more of a target guy than a touchdown guy uh, with Jordy Nelson mm -hmm. back, and I also think Jared Cook's going to be involved in the the red zone. So Cobb's not going to be a huge fantasy performer outside of those PPR formats, uh, but I am looking at the Lions. You know, it's interesting that. Uh, Amir Abdullah is now out for the season, so Theo Riddick, who's more of a passing down back, is now a feature back, um, and, and his price is really not there as a starter yet. So if he, if he's really a feature back, which there's so few of those now in the NFL, uh, Riddick's going to be a, an outstanding value for some players. Yeah, certainly agree. There, there, there's talk about Dwayne Washington making an impact and Zach Zenner, but. I think Riddick's really the only guy they're going to trust with, you know, a significant amount of touches. Um, as far as the rest of the team, kind of lukewarm on Stafford and Tate and Marvin Jones this week. I, I think overall you're just kind of looking at the Packers, big guns there. Indeed. Um, 
Broncos and Bengals. Look away. <laughs> this is this is a brutal game that lines up for uh, DFS. You know, you got yeah. two sound defenses and conservative offenses with game managing quarterbacks. A low number of forty one total on the Vegas board. Both defenses are tough on quarterbacks and receivers. Um, you know, the saving grace I think in this game will be the heavy usage of the backs. So C.J. Anderson has been, uh, you know, a, a heavily used offensive weapon in the run game and pass game, and he will be, while the numbers might not look good, he will be productive on the, you know, uh, the volume type carries. And uh, Jeremy Hill has eight touchdowns in his past ten games. While I don't think you necessarily guarantee a run, uh, rushing score against the Dol uh, Broncos defense. The Bengals are at home, so um, you can go there. And then Giovanni Bernard is coming off a, a nice uh, career-high nine catches and a touchdown with 100 yards last week. So I think the backs are where you're going if you're playing in this game. And if there was ever a week to not touch A.J. Green and feel okay about it, this is probably the one, right? Right. <laughs> um. As far as Andy Dalton goes, I don't trust him. I actually think the Broncos are an interesting defense to, to think about using. Uh, I see a lot of people picking the Bengals in this game. I I just trust the Broncos too much at this stage. I think they're going to pull this one out. Wow, a little, uh, little road upset. I, uh, yeah. I am not as confident in the Broncos winning the game. But you have to be wary of that defense against any quarterback. They're just they're gonna finish number one against fantasy quarterbacks. And Andy Dalton's not a guy you play in a tough matchup. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Uh, another interesting game here against two good defenses and one offense that looked good, but who knows? The Vikings and the Panthers. You trust in Sammy Bradford to go into Carolina and uh, <laughs> and take no. care of business? <laughs> no, that's gonna go badly. <laughs> um, you know, the one interesting thing about this game is it's kind of the season long waiver wire pickup running backs game. You know, Jarek McKinnon and uh, Asiata, Matt Asiata, are taking over for Adrian Peterson. And then on the Panthers side, uh, they lost Jonathan Stewart for a few weeks with a hamstring injury. So Cameron Artis Payne is going to start, uh, but you can see Foswick Whitaker or um, uh, Tolbert, you know, you know, big backs that will. Uh, punish up front but against the Vikings front you don't like those and against the Panthers front you don't like those so the the running backs while their values are low and they're not priced as starters even though they are the matchup's not there which is kind of unfortunate you know last week uh the Panthers at home you got a you, you won uh GPPs with Cam Newton Calvin Benjamin Greg Olson in the uh Panthers defense I don't think you necessarily get those elite numbers out of that crew, but any of them at home um, in general are pretty good values. Uh, I, I'm not loving Newton because I just don't think, like last week, this game's not going to get as loose. The Vikings are going to keep it a little lower on the total uh, than the 49ers were able to do off a of Monday night game. So, uh, again, not in love with this game because of the quality of both defenses, but if you're playing something – Olsen, he, he's been great at home, and he had a huge week last week with the long touchdown, so he's probably my favorite play of all. You know, as soon as Adrian Peterson got hurt, I was like, oh, Jarek McKinnon. And then I went and checked the schedule, and I was like, like, dang it. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think he'll have his day uh, in the sun, but this week is, is just – it's – it's a really tough matchup for the running games on both sides, as you mentioned. So you're really trying to get blood from the stone here. Uh, as far as Cam Newton goes, I, I think he is an intriguing contrarian guy. Like you mentioned, maybe stack him with Greg Olson, but not cash options. And and, and Newton's pretty expensive at this stage. So I, I think it's it, it, a little easier to avoid him than, than, say, last week or something like that. Mm -hmm. And Stefan Diggs, what are you doing with him this week? Uh, again, it's the, the defense and the, the, the way that the Panthers play. It's not going to be a wide-open throwing game. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a smash-mouth. Uh, you know, there are, there are moments that you're going to get Diggs off play action, uh, making big plays and getting long touchdowns. But uh, the Panthers play cover three over the top, and uh, – uh, you know, they famously made uh, Josh Norman the cover three corner that he is. 
So uh, they're not going to – the Vikings aren't going to get the big plays or they've gotten out of Stefan Diggs. So uh, fade him this week. I know he's had great numbers. Um, and Bradford, you know, he won't be horrible, but in bad road matchups, yeah. no way I'm touching anything on the Vikings offense. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I just worry about Sam Bradford. I mean, he was taking some major hits last week. I, I worry how long he's going to last with that O-line. So uh, certainly something to watch there. Next matchup here, Redskins and Giants. Is there a little intriguing upside here, or am I just kind of out Yeah, of no, I agree with you. And it's Eli Manning and the Giants who, uh, you know, victimized – so many GPP lineups last week with their failure to get in the end zone against the Saints defense. Their one touchdown was a defensive score on a block kick. Um, but Eli Manning's receivers played well um, outside the drops and the fumbles. So Eli Manning, um, Odell Beckham in a, a premium matchup against Josh Norman. And Josh Norman's usually just on one side of the field. But the uh, Redskins, with their struggles in the pass game, are going to allow now Norman to take out uh, Beckham. So you can fade Beckham, but if you do that, you got to love Sterling Shepard, who's had very good numbers in each of the first two weeks. Victor Cruz, who's had solid numbers in the both both these two weeks. So then Eli Manning, uh, all three of those guys against the Redskins defense uh, that hasn't played very well against the pass. So, um, you know, there there is more to like with the Giants particularly when everybody's off the bandwagon after they failed to do the damage against the Saints. Uh, I think they do the damage here against the Redskins. I, I like that call with Sterling Shepard. I think that's sort of the interesting way to go there. Um, as far as Jordan Reed, is that someone you're looking at maybe to get yeah. a little more upside than he's had in past weeks? Yeah, the Giants' corners have played great. You know, They, they took out Des Bryant in week one. They minimized the Brandon Cooks in week two. Uh, you know, Jason Witten did went nine for 66 in week one. And, uh, you know, those two young safeties are raw three, if you consider uh, Thompson coming in for Brewery. Um, and Kobe Fleener did get eight targets, despite the fact that you got just two catches uh, for the Saints last week. So the tight ends do get play. And Jordan Reed had two 95 plus yard games uh, in the two, each of the meetings last year against the Giants. So Jordan Reed's going to be uh, targeted early and often, and uh, Rashard Jennings, if you want to go uh, back to the Giants here, uh, the Redskins have given up two rushing touchdowns in each of the first two games, and uh, Jennings has gone for 100 and a touchdown in two of his past three at home. So there, there's potentially some numbers along the board for the Giants' offense. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are kind of souring on paying up for tight end. I think this could be a nice week for Reed in, in terms of ownership and just – Straight up scoring, you know. Mm -hmm. Ninety-five uh, and a touchdown. Yeah, I, I think I think that's actually pretty reasonable. Uh, Rams and Buccaneers. Oh boy, what do you got for me, Eric? Well, this uh, being a road game for the Rams, coming off that home victory, where it's a, a like a offensive mess against the Seahawks, mm. and I know the Bucks front is good. Um, but I think this might be a week that Todd Gurley impacts the passing game. You know, helps his quarterback out with some short passes. You know, he hasn't had those numbers yet. I, th I think he's only had a, one catch in each of the first two games, but one catch last week for 19 yards. I think Gurley get, it gets involved that way. He gets the ball in his hands more than 20 times for the first time this season. And I think Gurley's got good numbers against the Bucs. And uh, on the Bucs side, uh, without Doug Martin, uh, it, you gotta you gotta love Mike Evans. You know he's had consistent numbers each of the first two weeks, and then uh, Charles Sims. While you won't run the ball on the Rams defense, you know they they knocked out Thomas Rawls last week. Um, Charles Sims can do some uh, work in the passing game, so I, I'm liking the backs in this game. Um, you know the totals just 42, so it could be a slower slower game, but uh, both running backs could be heavily involved. Yeah, Charles Sims is a nice price anyway, really, you look at it. So I do like that call. I'm always a fan of Gurley. I think this could definitely be a week where, you know, the first two games were, were pretty tough. I actually think the 49ers run defense isn't going to be horrible this year. Right. Uh, in terms of 
This matchup itself, I, I do look at Gurley. I do look at Charles Sims. We like the Rams, you know, front group there, but I think on those passing downs, like you mentioned, Charles Sims out of the backfield, they're they're definitely prone to missing assignments in that secondary. So mm-hmm. I, I do like Sims to maybe get get loose, as you say, um, on a, on a few plays there. And Mike Evans, I mean, I, I think that's a premium pay up at wide receiver this week. Uh, especially with Jameis Winston coming off a bad, uh, you know, outing. Austin Safarian Jenkins got a DUI last night, I guess. So I don't know what his snaps are going to look like. So I think he's going to get a ton of targets again. Uh, yeah, I, I've liked Evan's consistency. And then when you look at Doug, uh, Martin being out, you know, he, mm. he becomes even more prominent in that offense. Certainly. So this is – this could be the ugliest game of the week. <laughs> uh, 49ers, Seahawks. I, I wonder if Russell Wilson's actually getting better because I know sometimes those ankles just linger, you know. So I think we kind of just play it by ear with him, and I, I just – I don't know. What, do you, what are you thinking about the Seahawks offense? Yeah, it's been bad, but uh, I'm also going to, um, you know, Follow up on last week, you know, the GPPs were won by the the Panthers being the big favorite at home against these same 49ers. And it was uh, not necessarily uh, expected that the Panthers would have huge weeks offensively because the 49ers played very well on defense. But the Seahawks, I think, could be that uh, GPP surprise. You know, I'm going to make it a strategy every week to stack the biggest favorite at home uh, and, and use those guys. So last week it was Cam Newton, Calvin Benjamin, Greg Olson, Graham Gano, and the Panthers defense. This week I'm going to put a stack out there of Russell Wilson, Tyler Lockett, because I'm not uh, confident right now on Doug Baldwin's health, and Lockett's had huge games against the 49ers in the past, uh, Stephen Hauschka and the Seahawks defense. Um, also because the running game uh, should struggle but against that improved 49ers defensive front, Rawls is banged up. You don't know exactly how Rawls and Michael Timeshare might play out. Uh, I'm, I'm liking the fact that Lockett has three TDs in two games against the 49ers. So I'm going to stack uh, a little Seahawks action and go with a big Seahawks performance here. I think that's very intriguing and not something I'd necessarily thought about yet, but I certainly like the the Seahawks defense. Uh, I think that's a really, really interesting play along with Hauschka. Uh, Russell Wilson, we all know the talents there. I, I do like that stack with Lockett with Baldwin sort of ailing, um, and I agree. If you're stacking, you're not really going with the run game here. I don't really know what's going on there. They said Rawls is going to play, but you don't really know how much he's going to play, and then – Kristen Michaels, Kristen Michael, even though he's been looking good, and mm-hmm. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I do think that's an interesting stack. Uh, as far as the 49ers, completely. No way. That's another reason I like the Seahawks in this game. You yeah. won't like anything on the 49ers. You know, the one strength is Carlos Hyde running the ball, but look what they did against Gurley last week, the Seahawks defense. You're not going to get Carlos Hyde numbers here. Um, so it's going to be a Seahawks like slapping them around type performance. Uh, one thing I will say about Rawls, um, if the reports before the game are positive that he'll play and start, he did go off for two oh nine and a touchdown in the Seahawks win last year against the Forty Nine ers. So and then Wilson threw for three touchdowns as well. Um, so that Seahawks stack to me uh, is a sleeper sleeper option. Oh, you're getting me back in on the Seahawks. There. <laughs> There it is. All right. Well, that's going to be happening for me, at least in one tournament lineup. Uh, Jets and Chiefs, kind of an ugly matchup on the outset, but then you kind of look at it and you're like, you know what, maybe maybe there are some plays in here. Yeah, I think the, the Jets are one of the more underrated offenses in football. You look at what Matt Forte has done in two games, you know, coming off the three-touchdown performance. He's averaging 30 touches a game, and they say there's no reason to slow him down right now. So – uh, Fort, uh, Forte is one of the few, uh, maybe the only true feature back in football right now. Uh, even though he's 30 years old and passed his prime in fantasy d- numbers, you know, the, the Chiefs have given up the fourth most points to fantasy backs. While their defense is pretty tough against a run, fine. They'll throw the ball to Forte. 
Um, and they'll throw the ball to Forte a lot this week because you get Brandon Marshall banged up with a knee and a foot. You got Eric Decker banged up with a shoulder. Uh, Fitzpatrick, I'm not playing him, and I'm not playing those two banged up receivers against the Chiefs who figure to be one of the tougher teams against quarterbacks. But I'm loving Forte uh, for his touches and involvement in the passing game. And then on the Chiefs side, you know, uh, Jamal Charles probably is unlikely to play. Um, but you can't guarantee Spencer Ware gets that tough Jets run defense. Uh, so I'm going with Macklin or Kelsey uh, to do the damage. You know, the Jets have been getting torched by wideouts, giving up the second most points in fantasy. You saw what A.J. Green did that first week, and then even the Bills, who fired their offensive coordinator, had <laughs> huge plays out of Marquise Goodwin and um, uh, Greg Salas. So the, there are big plays to be made in the pass game. Uh, uh, for the Chiefs. So I'm liking Macklin, Kelsey, and then Forte. Agreed. And so I think early on, around week three, you have to start to realize maybe some of your preseason predictions were wrong. Uh, <laughs> one of mine was definitely Bilal Powell playing a bigger role this year. And, uh, I mean, week one it was kind of like, hey, okay, maybe. He's maybe there, he's there. <laughs> and then week two was like, oh, okay, no, he's definitely not. And I think this might be the week for me to actually say, okay, uh, we know Forte is going to get this workload now. I think we just fire away with him. As you mentioned, um, this Chiefs defense uh, hasn't been quite what um, we've expected to begin the year. So I do like that matchup. As you mentioned, Macklin, not quite as worried about Revis as, as I used to be, I guess. He has been getting torched. Yep. And here we go, Chargers Colts. Probably the game I'm I'm most excited about this week. Uh, are you feeling similar to me? Uh, yeah. Well, this is an easy game to love when you get two gunslinging yeah. quarterbacks. It's the Volts versus the Colts. You know, the Chargers Colts. <laughs> I think they're both gonna try to light it up. And when you look at the Colts secondary, uh, probably one of the worst in football. I know the uh, Trevor Simeon and the Broncos couldn't really expose it last week. Uh, but that Colts defense is bad. I'm loving Melvin Gordon. I think he's the must-play running back of the week. Um, you know, with Danny Hood head down, I think Gordon's going to be involved in the short passing game. Phillip Rivers has always been one to use his tight ends and running backs often. Uh, Gordon's going to get a lot of work on uh, in both passing and running games. And then, you know, you can love Antonio Gates as a, a frequent target. You know, Travis Benjamin, he showed up huge last week. In the absence of Allen, I still like Tyrell Williams. Um, you know, Rivers is going to be in a shootout here, so you can like Rivers. I think you can like a lot of the Chargers against that Colts uh, defense and secondary. In fact, I think every week you're going to like everyone against that defense. <laughs> uh, and then some, uh, and then the Colts side, you know, it's going to be tough stopping Andrew Luck at home with uh, Dante Moncrief out. I think that puts even more volume on T.Y. Hilton. Uh, and Dwayne Allen, I think Luck, Allen, and Hilton will be a nice stack. Uh, both sides of this game uh, line up very nicely for a buku amount of fantasy points. You you mentioned what I consider a cash stack in Luck, Hilton, Allen. I, I think that's a, a tremendous combination. And then, you know, get Gordon, maybe get Gordon involved in that lineup too, and I think you got a heck of a lineup to start off. Uh, in terms of Melvin Gordon, it's been a long run for, for us Melvin Gordon fans. Um, <laughs> last year was extremely painful, and everyone hated him. And I'm just happy to be back to the point where everyone just doesn't hate him. They may not think he's good yet, but they don't hate him. So I'm happy we're here. Um, Got to love the prices on both sides. And yeah. Add the fact that Woodhead's out, you know, that that yeah. volume Woodhead was getting is now going to be on Gordon. And, uh you know, the young guy, he's he's yeah. he's built to handle the workload. Certainly, certainly agree. Uh, as far as River go, Rivers goes, I think we're looking at maybe Travis Benjamin again. Um, but, yeah, I, I love this game. I, I think there's a lot of cash game options for sure. Um, as far as the next game here, Steelers and Eagles, I, I will start off by asking, is D'Angelo Williams going to get 30 touches again? Uh, I think he will because the game is going to be so heavily in hand for the Steelers. I think the uh, Eagles' love right now is a bit surprising. You know, the Steelers are just a three-point favorite, or uh, yeah, three-point favorite 
I think this game is going to be a wipeout. I think the Steelers are going to dominate the Eagles. I know they're 2-0, and and Carson Wentz is drawing a lot of praise right now. But the Browns and whoever they start at quarterback and the Bears with Jay Cutler is no Steelers and Big Ben. I think this is going to be a mess for the Eagles. And the Steelers, uh, you know, load up on Big Ben, D'Angelo, and Brown. Uh, you know, three premium guys and price, but uh, they're going to be premium in production and volume against a Eagles defense that has been playing well, but they've been playing scrubs. So I think you can benefit I, uh, with a little bit of a, a rebound, uh, a correction to the mean for the Eagles defense. I, I like that call a lot. Um, there is a lot of Eagles love out there. Um, I certainly am a fan of Jordan Matthews. You mentioned him as a good play in your article, which I do believe he is. But, I mean, they've kind of been doing it semi-quietly, but the Steelers have just been crushing people. And, um, I mean, D'Angelo Williams getting, you know, 30 touches a game. Antonio Brown's really the main guy there, obviously. So, yeah, no, I, I agree with this. The, the Eagles are facing, as you mentioned, basically their first legit team of the year. I, I don't I worry think this about, is a legit team. I don't think the Eagles are legit. Uh, yeah, no, I mean the Steelers. Oh. Like the Eagles are facing the Steelers, which is their first oh, right, legit right, team. Okay. As you mentioned, the, the Jay Cutler-led Bears and not even – and then turned into the Brian – Brian Hoyer led Bears <laughs> after <laughs> after two quarters. So, yeah, that was ugly. Um, as far as Carson Wentz goes, he's young. I could see the Steelers, you know, baiting him into a few mistakes for sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you covered it pretty well here. One interesting thing on the Steelers, I'm curious to see what Marcus Wheaton uh, will do. I know he could play this week. Um, if he doesn't, you got to like uh, Sammy Coates potentially as a sleeper, but – um, if you're fading Brown because all the attention he warrants. But uh, I'm curious to see what Wheaton can do. Uh, and, you know, the Eagles' defense is probably not as good as it's shown. Uh, so if, if there's an added weapon to Big Ben's arsenal, maybe it'll be Wheaton. I like that call. Uh, Bears and Cowboys. Oh, boy. <laughs> I wrote pass. I'm like, ugh. There, there, there is just uh, two offenses with quarterbacks uh, situations you can't trust. An elite receiver on both sides, but you look at the quarterback and you're like, Ugh, can I really put my uh, DFS? So with that said, I think you go with Ezekiel Elliott. I think this is going to be a career day for Elliott. You know, the Bears allowed 106 yards to Lamar Miller, and they gave up two rushing TDs to Ryan Matthews something that's pretty tough to do. So I think uh, Elliot trumps both those numbers and goes 120-2, and two, kind of his breakthrough uh, game for him, you know, with the Cowboys being back at home. Uh, they, they had a clean run performance against that Giants defensive front, but that Giants defense is good up front. The Bears defense not as good up front. I think this is a big week for Ezekiel Elliott. I, I like that call, and if you watched any of that Monday night game, I mean, the Bears' defense is just uh, – honestly, they're just a sorry group at this point. They did I, – I know they lost one of their guys in that game, Eddie Goldman. Uh, he was – he's going to be out for this week. So that that uh, that team just looks sad at this point. I kind of feel bad for them, but that doesn't mean we can't exploit them in DFS for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Zeke Elliott, really the only guy I, I trust right now. I love Dez, but with Dak there, it's kind of, like you mentioned, it's kind of tough to really fire him in there at, at his current prices. Um, Cole Beasley is a minimum play on, on DK, basically, and – I might do that maybe in one or two lineups, but overall I think Zeke's the guy. Um, and that's pretty much it in this game. You could like the Cowboys' defense because, you know, the Bears mm. could make some mistakes and force some turnovers. And it's a game that's uh, a big number for the Cowboys as a favorite, and that's a big number when they really don't even have a, an elite quarterback. So uh, it could be a big game for the Cowboys defensively and with L. Definitely. And the last game, the Monday night, that is going to almost certainly, you know, shift a lot of matchups when you're going into Monday thinking you're going to win, and then it's gonna it's gonna be painful for a lot of people. <laughs> Falcons Saints, uh, fifty three and a half uh, over under. 
So this is this is going to be a big boy, I think. I think I, I need to give you credit because I believe it was you that said I'm not in love with Drew Brees on the road. And last week I was in love with mm-hmm. Drew Brees and Eli Manning going after it. Um, but this week I'm going to stay on Drew Brees and the Saints at home against the Falcons and let this game uh, get lit up. I know the numbers last year weren't huge when the two met met up, uh, but that Falcons secondary was playing well last year. They were one of the best uh, pass defenses in football, and this year they're not as good. You know, um, uh, you know. I think uh, 303 is a baseline for Breeze, um, and he, you know he's had 23 of his 32 t- touchdowns at home last season. Um, you know, Breeze, Brandon Cooks, Willie Sneed, all very good plays. Uh, I don't love Fleener because uh, last week he had eight targets and just two receptions, and that was the knock. Um, Drew Brees is a guy that likes efficiency on offense. He's not efficient when he goes to Fleener, so it's more Cooks and Sneed. Uh, and I do love the back, too. I love Mark Ingram added to that stack. You know, the Falcons have been fifth worst, fifth, fifth worst against fantasy backs. Uh, and then uh, Julio Jones, you know, against those, those – uh, uh, second rate, uh, if not third rate corners for the Saints. You know, the Giants did throw for 350 yards because those corners are not good. Julio Jones should have it easy against them. Uh, particularly if this game is wide open, you know, the, the Falcons are going to stay in it because Julio Jones is a threat to score on any given play. Uh, and then I actually like uh, Devonta Freeman and Tevin Coleman. I know they're in a full timeshare, um, but, uh, you know, they. The uh, Saints gave up three rushing touchdowns to the Raiders, and Freeman and Coleman can both combine for 80 yards uh, passing and receiving a piece, and each both get into the end zone. I love them as sneaky plays this week. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, against the Saints team, we've seen this for a few years now where – you don't need a lot of touches to to have a big impact. I think Devonta Freeman is certainly that type of guy. You're going to get low ownership on him. And this is the type of game you want to, you know, have as many pieces as you can. You mentioned the uh, the Breeze, Cooks, Sneed stack here. Um, I, I think that's very interesting, and I certainly like all those options. That That's a crazy stat about 23 of 32 last season for, <laughs> yeah. for his passing touchdowns. That's that's insane. Um, so I, I certainly think this is going to be a game like that. Matt Ryan's been been playing well. I, c- I expect that to continue. Um, Muhammad Sanu is another guy that's definitely in play here. Uh, but, yeah, overall, you should be trying to get some shares of this game. And, honestly, in the 14-game Sunday slate um, on – on, on DraftKings, as opposed to you know getting that Monday night in, I just want to avoid this game um, if I can <laughs> this week, unless I'm you know stacking them. So this right. is kind of the move for me. Yeah, there'll be a lot of points, but I'm wondering what's going to have more fireworks: the game in the Superdome or the presidential debate between Donald Trump oh. and Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I, I've never been more excited, honestly, for yeah. in my entire life. I have no idea what's going to be said, but I'd imagine yeah. emails are going to be mentioned. I'd imagine, you know, some random person's going to run up the up uh, up on the stage and like <laughs> yell at them. Like it's shocked. just going to be bananas, right? Oh, it's going to be pure madness. I think the Monday Night Football game. Uh, I'm kind of disappointed that it's this one. I wish it was the Eagles Bears one that I, I kind of just mm. fell asleep through, um, because I want to watch both events and uh, I think that's a fine topper um, for this week three slate. Abs- absolutely. So not only are we a um, a DFS show, but we are also <laughs> a presidential podcast show. So we deserve <laughs> your respect. Yeah. Um, as always, you know, you can check out Eric's work on, on the website. He does this right up every week for us. So you can definitely check that out while you're making lineups. Um, while you're there, you know, definitely check out our cool tools and, um, other content. Um, and Hey, if you like what we're doing on these videos, give us a like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. So, uh, we will see you guys in week four and good luck in week three.